Hi everybody, welcome to week two of the Lenten series, Who Do You Say That I Am? That is a look at faith and incarceration through the lens of faith. I want to acknowledge that the curriculum is adapted from Catholic Prison Ministries Coalition and I am grateful for the work that they have done. Our session today is called Session 2. I want to introduce myself again also. I'm Terry Stewart. I am a pastor in the American Baptist tradition. I came up through the United Methodist tradition and moved over to that. And I am a chaplain in juvenile detention or religious coordinator uh, running and uh, coordinating the uh, religious volunteers at both King County and at Echo Glen Children's Home. So today we're going to be looking at the topic of heavy hope because there are some hard places that people get stuck into and hope is not always easy to carry. Let us pray. God, you have given all peoples one common origin. It is your will that they be gathered together as one family in yourself. Fill the hearts of humankind with the fire of your love and with the desire to ensure justice for all by sharing the good things you give us. May we secure an equality for all our siblings throughout the world. May there be an end to division, strife, and war. May there be a dawning of a truly human society built on love and peace. We ask this in your name. Amen. Welcome again to this space. Uh, I'm not going to introduce myself again. I've already done that, but I do want to do a little bit of a look back at what we had done last session. We talked a lot about statistics of mass incarceration and its impact on people in all levels in the, of the criminal justice system, whether it's the person who was harmed, the person who did harm, the families of the victims, the families of the person incarcerated, even the community. There is harm to go around to every single person. Then I also want to give a little bit of an idea about what we're going to do. We're going to talk today about Christian social teaching. That is such a broad topic. Uh, I do want to preface that I will be sitting in my own kind of social location of being American Baptist. And so I will come from that perspective. You may be from a different faith tradition, I encourage you to uh, go research what your tradition says about our responsibilities to the social order of the world, like how we interact with one another. It's not like, uh, and there's a lot of talk about like social justice in the world, but this is really about how we are socially with each other, how we care for one another, how we do exactly what Jesus asked us to do, which is to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. So Christian social teaching is vastly different in the different traditions. And I was able to uh, find this list, but there's different teachings that go back to Genesis about how we should be with one another. You can think of the Ten Commandments. For me, and for many Christians, we rest on Matthew 25. Um, my own um, faith journey is largely rooted in this scripture right here. And the church has a long history of emphasizing outreach to those who have been marginalized. And we can see it in this piece of scripture. And that, that is part of our tradition. It sees the good of our neighbors and the good of all, and maybe even a common good. Some of the uh, ideals embodied in Christian social teaching are the life and dignity of the human person, a call to family, community, and participation, knowing the rights and responsibilities we have within our society, an option to care for the poor and vulnerable, the dignity of work and the rights of workers, solidarity, and care for God's creation. So do you know what your Christian faith community's social teaching is? 
So my tradition is American Baptist, and in this tradition, authority rests in the local church, so there can be variations in the way that social teaching is lived out, broadly different from one church to the other. But from the American Baptist USA website, you can find this list of called 10 facts you, you should know about American Baptists. So within the 10, there's a few points that might pertain to what we would call social teaching. American Baptists take seriously the call to evangelism and missionary work, meaning we go out into the world to do work. The American Baptist worldwide mission is a response to Christ's call to make disciples of all nations. Uh, bringing people to loving kindness with one another. And through the efforts of missionaries, whether that is missionaries abroad or missionaries right here caring for one another, there are is evangelism, healing, education, listening, development, teaching. All of these things make Christ's love known. Maybe we think of evangelism that way. Making Christ's love known in the U.S. and around the world. So that's kind of one of the American Baptist ways. And so for me, that is directly applicable to going into prisons and those kind of hard spaces. Another point is American Baptists support religious freedom and respect the expressions of faith of others. So the American Baptists came together actually as a response to intolerance and have been cherishing freedom and pursued it for many people around the world. They, the ideals are like separation of church and state, advocating for people everywhere to be guaranteed the right to worship free from discrimination, and lifting up respectful dialogue as a healthy means to understanding. That is core for me in the work that I do because I feel passionate that our youth should have the religious freedoms uh, protected whether that is uh, a freedom to participate in the religion of their choice or a freedom from religion it is a uh, I feel very strongly like this is a space we need to be in so that we can ensure that youth who are caught at the intersection of faith and state are able to have their rights that are protected now that's just my personal opinion and it has a lot to do with my job so you might have some different thoughts. American Baptists also acknowledge that God's family extends beyond our own family and beyond our local churches and that God calls us to do ministry with each other. I think that is pretty clear. And the way that it applies to Christian social teaching is that it is, it's beyond our walls. It is that loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself so that you are reaching out and loving all the people, not just the ones that you choose. And then last, I want to lift up that American Baptists have been called to Christ's witness for justice and wholeness within a broken society. So the way that the American Baptist Church USA states it is they say American Baptists have been led by the gospel mandates to promote holistic change within society as witnessed by their advocacy of freed African Americans followed by the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, women in church and societal leadership ecological responsibility and many other issues while not all of one mind as to how to deal with challenges american baptists do affirm the need to follow christ's example by being actively involved in changing society oh i lied there's one more point the american baptist churches usa celebrate the racial cultural and theological diversity uh, that is in the world. So we are not ever trying to make things one way, but we embrace everything that is. So within the American Baptist context, we can put those together and kind of come up with an idea about what their social teachings would be, which would be to definitely to bring justice, equality, equity to the world, to bring a message of love and to protect one another's cherished freedoms and to protect each other's faith walks. So I have some uh, questions about 
what could be called Christian social teaching. Some questions for you to think about. So I'm just going to read the question and give you space. So what rights do you feel should be made accessible to incarcerated men, women, and youth? What rights do you feel are removed from a person once they are incarcerated? What rights are taken away from the victims of crime, the family members of the incarcerated, and the family members of the victim? If you want to, you can pause the screen here, jot the questions down, and hold them for your own pondering later. So we're going to do a kind of a true false exercise and you can just keep your own score. I'm trusting you to do the right thing here. And I'm just going to raise up points and you're going to say whether it's true or it's false. You can say agree, disagree, unsure, but I'm using the words true and false throughout this. So maybe you stick with that, make it easier. So I'm going to read a statement and then we'll decide is it true or false. Incarceration in the U.S. has increased by 50% over the past 40 years. What do you think? That, that's false. The U.S. has seen a 500% increase in prison population over the past 40 years. The United States makes up approximately 5% of the world's population. The United States also holds about 5% of the world's prisoners. Do you remember this from last week? The U.S. holds almost 25% of the world's prison population. And then they are also about 4% of the world's population. There are approximately 1 million people incarcerated in the United States today. What do you think? A million? The U.S. incarcerates more than 2.4 million people. You have worked with someone who has been in jail, prison, or detention. This is not a true-false question. This is just a statement of fact. You have. You've been in association with someone who has been in jail, prison, or detention. One in three Americans of working age have a criminal record. I don't know why I put applause sounds there because that's not really something we should applaud. One in three Americans of working age have a criminal record. So that definitely brings home the previous point, which is out of every three people around you, including you, like one of them has been uh, touched by the justice system. There are more colleges than jails in the United States. There are more jails than colleges. America spends 80 billion per year on incarceration. Imagine if we had 80 billion dollars to put towards uh, homelessness or uh, addiction or any other social project that we might have. We could do a lot. Education, health. The majority of people in prison have been convicted of a violent crime. What do you think? False. Only 8% of federal prisoners were sentenced for violent crime in 2011. Almost half of federal inmates were in prison for drug crimes, and 11% were held for immigration-related offenses. You know someone who is at risk of being incarcerated or detained. That's just true. That's not a true or false. You do know someone. You may not know it yet, but you do know someone. One out of every 100 prisoners is serving life without parole sentences. What do you think? 
It's more severe than that. One in 30 are serving life without parole. Prisoners can only be sentenced to life without parole for violent crimes. Well, we just did that other question about violent crimes, so I think you already know the answer to this. Over 3,000 prisoners are currently serving life without parole for nonviolent crimes, such as shoplifting or selling marijuana. That's what happens when you have three strike laws. Shoplifting becomes a life sentence. One in 10 prisoners who are released will return to prison. The numbers are much worse than that. Within five years of release, 75%, three quarters of the released prisoners were re-arrested. And of those re-arrested, more than half were arrested by the end of the first year. So it really peaks up there in the first year. The meaning that we don't actually do restoration and healing in our prisons. We just hold people away and we don't fix them. Then we send them back out and they do the same thing that they might have done before. So uh, it's not a very good or smart plan. Less than 1% of people sentenced to death row were found to be wrongfully convicted. 4.1% of defendants, or 1 in 25 sentenced to death in the U.S., are later shown to be innocent. That's from the Washington Post. And from the educationforjustice.org. Uh, One in three black men between the ages of 20 and 29 live under some form of correctional supervision. This is unfortunately true. A large part of this has to do with implicit bias within people and systemic racism that is built into institutions and uh, start early on in people's lives in uh, communities that are very often pressed under poverty and stress. Um, so it's not to do with black men being criminals. It is to do with how society treats black men. The truth of the matter is that you can look at drug uh, drug crimes and look at drug crimes for uh, ethnicity and you will find that people who are white and people who are black commit drug crimes at the same rate, the same kinds of offenses, but you will find many more black men in prison for drug crimes than you will find for white uh, men who are had drug crimes. And that just is amplified at every single step in the justice system when there's even small decisions like do you charge a juvenile as a youth or as an adult the uh, likelihood of a black youth being charged as an adult is greater than a white youth being charged as an adult for the same crimes at every decision point in the process implicit bias is built into the system that falls disproportionately on the shoulders of young black men so let's take a few minutes and reflect on some questions and you can feel free to type them in the uh, kind of chat down there or you can just uh, hold the uh, questions and answers to yourself. So how was that exercise for you? Were there any facts that surprised you? And how, how did they surprise you? Was there anything there that you struggled with? And can you connect some of those facts back to Christian social teaching principles with an idea about maybe what our principles might say about that fact and what we could do?
We're about to watch a recording of, from a returned citizen who was sentenced to 30 years to life at San Quentin and he got out after 10. I want to warn you that he uses language that not all of us will be used to and he relays some pretty triggering or traumatic events. If you are sensitive to that, I would encourage you just to skip forward about eight minutes. So after receiving 30 years to life in prison um, and going to, you know, level four yard and seeing a lot of shit there and just like my whole overall experience with prison period, you know, y'all know y'all hear the war stories and on people's channels and shit. Um, you know, I've seen all that shit, seen people getting stabbed up, you know what I mean? Seen a guy get his throat cut open on the way to chow and literally have to step over his blood just to get where we're going, you know what I'm saying? Um, being on yards, uh, I was on a yard where, you know what I'm saying, there was just so much stabbings going on that it got to the point where, you know, someone would get stabbed up and they would just come out, take the dudes off, pour some, you know what I'm saying, some shit on, on the blood to soak it up and then the captain would just be like resume you know what i mean like continue yard it was nothing like you know what i mean kill each other you know what i'm saying and um i don't know shit like that in there you know became a norm and you kind of get you kind of just kind of get immune to seeing that shit every day and uh you know just living my life like that for over a decade you know what I'm saying? And um, having to, you know, when I was on lower levels where it was open dorms, you know what I'm saying? I'd literally have to sleep with a knife, you know, most times, you know, when there was tension and shit, especially when there was tension, you know? Um, so living like that for over a decade, you know, I didn't realize it was going to take a toll on me. <clears throat> and, uh, since I've been home, I've been home uh, since 2009, since 2009. So that's a long time, right? But it's crazy. I'm still literally doing time. And, you know, like some of the things that, that some of the behaviors I have, you know what I'm saying, is that out here is when we go out, me and my family, you know what I'm saying? If we go out to a restaurant or anything, you know, I gotta sit with my back to the wall. I gotta be facing the door or something, you know what I mean? And I got to be, you know, and I scan the whole restaurant and I know where everybody's sitting. I know what people are wearing and shit, you know what I'm saying? And it's just, you know, you get this heightened, you know, alertness or awareness about yourself, you know what I'm saying? When you were surviving in in a place where, you know, violence was just normal, you know what I'm saying? Like, I literally, you know what I'm saying, can't, I don't, I can't get comfortable, you know, in crowded places. Um, I don't have, I don't have no friendships, you know what I'm saying? I, I have homies, you know what I mean, that I talk to, you know what I'm saying? But most times I just, like we don't talk because I just don't want to hang out with people. I don't want to be around people. You know what I'm saying? I can't do, you know, friendships and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, and then there's always this like sense of paranoia. You know, where I always feel like, you know, I got one foot out here and one foot in there. You know what I'm saying? And I just feel like sometimes even though I ain't doing shit, you know what I mean? I've been, like I said, I've been out forever now. I've been doing really good, you know? I just sometimes feel like, man, they can just come get me at any minute, you know what I mean? And, 
you know, and if they wanted to take me for something, you know what I'm saying, like, you know, even if I didn't do anything, nobody's going to believe it, you know what I mean, because, you know, look where I've been, you know what I'm saying, I've been there already, you know, and uh, so I always have this, like, sense of paranoia within myself, you know, feeling like they're going to come get me, you know, um, I deal with nightmares, you know what I'm saying, uh, they're just like re reoccurring nightmares, you know, sometimes I, I won't have any other dreams but dreams about me in prison dealing with politics, dealing with other races, you know what I'm saying, um, always like, you know, ready to go to war and shit like that in there, and um, yeah, it's just a bunch of weird shit that that has happened, you know what I'm saying, and um, I'm dealing with that, you know what I mean, every day, you know, so that's some of the shit that comes with doing time or doing a lot of time in prison, you know what I'm saying, so you know what it is, stay the fuck out of trouble. I just really love Brian Stevenson and the way he talks about justice, mercy, and compassion. We're going to share a clip from his TED talk about disconnection and connection and places of hope. And he also fills it in with a lot of information about the justice system that we've been learning about. So I encourage you to uh, listen to him. And if you want to move past it, it's again, another like eight minute clip or so, and you can move past it. But he is an eloquent speaker. And in my heart, he is a faith leader. Well, I've been trying to say something about our criminal justice system. Uh, this country is very different today than it was 40 years ago. In 1972, there were 300,000 people in jails and prisons. Today, there are 2.3 million. The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We have 7 million people on probation and parole, and mass incarceration, in my judgment, has fundamentally changed our world. In poor communities, in communities of color, there is this despair, there is this hopelessness that is being shaped by these outcomes. But one out of three black men between the ages of 18 and 30 is in jail, in prison, on probation, or parole. In urban communities across this country, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, 50 to 60 percent of all young men of color are in jail or prison or on probation and parole. Our system isn't just being shaped in these ways that seem to be distorting around race, they're also distorted by poverty. We have a system of justice in this country that treats you much better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. Wealth, not culpability, shapes outcomes. And yet we seem to be very comfortable. The politics of fear and anger have made us believe that these are problems that are not our problems. We've been disconnected it's interesting to me. We're looking at some very interesting developments in our work. Uh, my state of Alabama, like a, n a number of states, actually permanently disenfranchises you if you have a criminal conviction. Right now in Alabama, 34% of the black male population has permanently lost the right to vote. We're actually projecting in another 10 years the level of disenfranchisement will be as high as it's been since prior to the passage of the Voting Rights Act, and there is this stunning silence. I represent children. A lot of my clients are very young. The United States is the only country in the world where we sentence 13-year-old children to die in prison. We have life imprisonment without parole for kids in this country. And we're actually doing some litigation. The only country in the world. 
Uh, I represent people on death row. It's interesting, this question of the death penalty. In many ways, we've been taught to think that the real question is, do people deserve to die for the crimes they've committed? And that's a very sensible question. But there's another way of thinking about where we are in our identity. The other way of thinking about it is not, do people deserve to die for the crimes they commit, but do we deserve to kill? I mean, it's fascinating. Death penalty in America is defined by error. For every nine people who have been executed, we've actually identified one innocent person who's been exonerated and released from death row. A kind of astonishing error rate, one out of nine people, innocent. I mean, it's fascinating, in, 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 in aviation, we would never let people fly on airplanes if for every nine planes that took off, one would crash. But somehow we can insulate ourselves from this problem. It's not our problem. It's not our burden. It's not our struggle. Well, I talk a lot about these issues. I talk about uh, a race and this question of whether we deserve to kill. And it's interesting, when I teach my students about African-American history, I tell them about slavery, I tell them about uh, terrorism, the era that began at the end of Reconstruction that went on to World War II. We don't really know very much about it, but for African-Americans in this country, that was an era defined by terror. In many communities, people had to worry about being lynched. They had to worry about being bombed. It was the threat of terror that shaped their lives. And these older people come up to me now, and they say, Mr. Stevenson, you give talks, you make speeches, you tell people to stop saying we're dealing with terrorism for the first time in our nation's history after 9-11. They tell me to say, no, tell them that we grew up with that. And that era of terrorism, of course, was followed by segregation, decades of racial subordination and apartheid. And and yet we have in this country this dynamic where we really don't like to talk about our problems. We don't like to talk about our history. And because of that, we really haven't understood what it's meant to do the things we've done historically. And we're constantly running into each other. We're constantly creating tensions and conflicts. We have a hard time talking about race. And I believe it's because we are unwilling to commit ourselves to a process of truth and reconciliation. In South Africa, People understood that we couldn't overcome apartheid without a commitment to truth and reconciliation. In Rwanda, even after the genocide, there was this commitment. But in this country, we haven't done that. I was giving this lecture in, in Germany, some lectures in Germany about the death penalty. It was fascinating because one of the uh, scholars stood up after the presentation and said, well, you know, it's deeply troubling to hear what you're talking about. I said, well, we don't have the death penalty in Germany. And of course, we can never have the death penalty in Germany. And the room got very quiet and this woman said, uh, there's no way with our history we can ever engage in the systematic killing of human beings. It would be unconscionable for us to, in an intentional, deliberate way, set about executing people. And I thought about that. What would it feel like to be living in a world where the nation state of Germany was executing people, especially if they were disproportionately Jewish? I couldn't bear it. It would be unconscionable. And yet in this country, in the states of the Old South, we execute people. We are 11 times more likely to get the death penalty if the victim is white than if the victim is black, 22 times more likely to get it if the defendant is black and the victim is white. In the very states where there are buried in the ground the bodies of people who were lynched, and yet there is this disconnect. Well, I believe that our identity is at risk that when we actually don't care about these difficult things, the positive and wonderful things are nonetheless implicated. We love innovation. We love technology. We love creativity. We love entertainment. But ultimately, those realities are shadowed by suffering, abuse, degradation, marginalization. And for me, it becomes necessary to integrate the two. Because ultimately, we are talking about a need to be more hopeful, more committed, more dedicated to the basic challenges of living in a complex world. And for, that mean, for, me, that, for me, that means spending time thinking and talking about the poor, the disadvantaged, those who will never get to TED. But thinking about them in a way that is integrated in our own lives. You know, ultimately, we all have to believe things we haven't seen. We do. As rational as we are, as committed to intellect as we are, innovation, creativity, uh, development comes 
not from the ideas in our mind alone. They come from the ideas in our mind that are also fueled by some conviction in our heart. And it's that mind-heart connection that I believe compels us to not just be attentive to all the bright and dazzling things, but also the dark and difficult things. Vaclav Havel, the great Czech leader, talked about this. He said, uh, when we were in Eastern Europe and dealing with oppression, we wanted all kinds of things, but mostly what we needed was hope, an orientation of the spirit, a willingness to sometimes be in hopeless places and be a witness. Well, that orientation of the spirit is very much at the core of what I believe even TED communities have to be engaged in. There is no so There's some resources and action that we can do. Again, reminding you like last week, we can pray, advocate and learn, volunteer, keep informed. You can visit my website. Uh, but I also want to say you can listen to the entirety of Brian Stevenson's TED Talk which is on YouTube, so it's pretty easy to find. Just Brian Stevenson, type in TED Talk, it'll come right up. And I appreciate each and every one of you for coming on this journey. So let us pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. There's some questions to sit with. Where do you sense God moving in you recently? Are there obstacles in your life keeping you from serving God and others? Is there a Christian social teaching principle that you want to learn more about and why? Which principle do you think the criminal justice system is in most need of? And how might God be inviting you into that space? I invite you to join us in our closing prayer, the servant song. You can sing along or just listen. Mm -hmm.